It is Matthew Trogdon versus Nicholas Beltran. Thank you. Uh, as you know, each party has 15 minutes to present oral arguments. The appellant proceeds first and may reserve up to uh, five minutes for rebuttal. Uh, if you wish to reserve uh, rebuttal time, if you'll let me know, I will be keeping time. We've read the briefs. We're ready when you are. I would like to reserve five minutes. Very well. Good morning, Thomas. My name is John Haynes. I represent the appellant in this case. Uh, this case started out uh, back in 2010. And the, the facts of the case are rather simple, actually. There were two young men uh, who were friends uh, by the name of Trogdon and Beltran. And for a number of reasons, Beltran transferred a, uh, an automobile, a 2009 Jeep Patriot that he had purchased uh, and paid cash for. He transferred it to his friend uh, uh, Beltran. And Beltran was, a, was somewhat of a villain. Uh, he had been uh, in trouble uh, with the law. Uh, Trogdon had been in trouble with the law. They had met uh, and became friends at a party. Uh, they spent a lot of time uh, smoking pot and traveling around in this vehicle. Neither one of them worked and there came a time when when Beltran moved in with Trogdon who lived with his mother and another relative. Uh, the mother didn't like the relationship and them driving around a lot so she sort of impounded the car. Uh, and an occasion turned out that uh, they got the car away from the mother and Beltran uh, talked Trogdon into transferring the car into his name. There was some evidence to suggest that uh, Trogdon was in fear that he would lose the car because it had been used in the commission of a crime that he was suspected of. In any event, they went to a Bureau of Motor Vehicles place in Avon Lake and uh, the title was transferred and Beltran ended up with a title signed over to him by Trogdon. Beltran then went to my client, Abraham Nissan, and uh, sold the car, traded in the car, uh, received a couple of thousand dollars in addition uh, in, the, in the deal and... Uh, you say they. What, did the record reflect that both of them went to your client or just, just the one? Just the one. One. Mm -hmm. One. Beltran. Uh, the, um, the next day after the deal had been consummated, um, the mother of Trogdon got in contact with, our, with, with people at our dealership uh, and said that there might have been a fraudulent transfer of this vehicle and would they hold the vehicle. And also the lawyer for the mother and, and Trogdon got in touch, uh, I think by mail, uh, with, with our people and they held the car and Sheffield Village, Sheffield Lake Police Department got involved and our people held the car for over a week. Uh, and then uh, the police in Sheffield Lake uh, said that there wasn't going to be a prosecution uh, and they sold the car to another person. And the and what was that? What evidence was that, that the police said there would be no prosecution? There was some testimony by Michael Abraham to that effect. Okay. Um, the the person that bought the car uh, was named in the lawsuit, but he has subsequently been dismissed. So he's that matter has been resolved. Uh, in March of 2010, March 1st, actually a a complaint for replevant was filed against my client. Uh, then it was amended several weeks later, uh, and uh, it was then amended a second time, uh, where the complaint was the the, uh, the action of fraud and negligence was attached to the to the to the original complaint. The case 
took several years to come to trial uh, because one of the participants for the law firm that originally represented the appellant, uh, uh, there was a conflict of interest and that was argued. Um, there were depositions taken, there was argument. But finally, the case came to trial uh, before Judge Birch in, upstairs in this, court, in this courthouse. And the main bone of contention in this case is the $57,000 in legal fees that were awarded to the appellees uh, in, in, in this lawsuit. And our, our, our belief is, is that because there were not punitive damages awarded, because that the court uh, did not find uh, bad faith fraud on our part, on the part of Abraham Nissan. Uh, the law in Ohio is such, it's called the American rule, is such that in a civil action, unless you find that there was either a contract that said that the person who was the wrongdoer is entitled to legal fees, or unless there is a statute that applies that says you can get legal fees, or unless there's punitive damages attached to the award, or unless there was bad faith, uh, you're not allowed to, to grant uh, compensatory attorney fees. In, in his April the 3rd, uh, 2012 ruling, Judge Birch uh, noted that he was giving uh, an award of attorney fees to make Trogdon whole. And when, and those words really mean I am compensating Trogdon. These are compensatory damages, and attorney fees in that case would not be, would not be proper. Uh, my client realizes now that if the court does not consider him a bona, bona fide purchaser because the car had been uh, wrested away from Beltran by fraud, uh, then he, he is liable to Trogdon for the price of the car. Um, my client in his second argument would say that he really, he really should not be forced to, to pay uh, for the value of that car because he got a, he got a, a valid title. Uh, and one of the reasons why we have the statute for valid valid titles from the Bureau of Motor Vehicles is to protect dealers and people that purchase vehicles from, from any, any wrongdoing or from, from someone that really doesn't own the vehicle. So, Well, with respect to those arguments, um, uh, Mr. Trotman takes the position that um, because there was a previous appeal, uh, the matters in um, assigned to Severa 1 through I believe it's four could have been raised. Those were all a matter of record at the end of the uh, trial. And so race judicata should bar you from being able to raise those matters on appeal. Both prior appeals were dismissed by this court for lack of a final appealable order. And since the issues were never addressed, uh, there's, there's, no, there's no race judicata issue in this case. Uh, the, the evidence in this case would indicate that the two, the two men that dealt with this vehicle, uh, particularly Trogdon, are stopped from, from coming in here and using that kind of an argument when, they, when the two of them uh, contrived to, to, to pass this car off. And, and our, our, our belief is, is that when an owner acts inconsider inconsistent with a claimed right, he is a stop from raising, uh, from raising, uh, from raising any of the issues that he raises in his brief. Uh, our people didn't know that these two people, these Trugden and Beltran, were were contriving together, acting in concert to 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 create a fraud here. They received, they received a, uh, a valid title, and, uh, and, and consequently, uh, 
in in this case, the, the judge never never ruled on whether there were punitive damages in this thing. The only way he could have given uh, Appley any damages at, at all was if, if he had found that, that our people had acted uh, in, in, in bad faith and, and, and awarded punitive damages in so doing so. so I think you are that, at your uh, five minute mark okay. if you wish to reserve the rest of the Thank you. Good morning, may it please the court. My name is Matt Dooley and Chris Demarius, and I represent Mr. Trogdon in this case, and we'd ask the court to affirm the trial court's ruling. The old adage goes, if you have the facts but not the law, argue one versus the other. We have both here. Uh, I want to start, Judge Moore, with your latest point, which was waiver. We've cited seven cases in our brief, most of which from the Supreme Court, that indicated if you fail to make an argument on your first appeal, you're barred from taking a second bite at the apple. You How does that relate to uh, cases in which um, there was no final order? Well, it's interesting. With all due respect to Mr. Haynes, we disagree with his statement that the court dismissed both appeals for lack of final appeal of order. In fact, the last appeal, this is the third, by the way, the last appeal the court actually ruled on and found that the trial court had lacked jurisdiction to award attorney's fees, but this court actually entertained that argument, made a ruling, and remanded it for further hearing on attorney's fees, which Judge McCorney had taken over by that point. But it did not dismiss it outright as it did the first appeal for lack of a final appealable order. The point being, Your Honors, is that Mr. Haynes and his client had every opportunity to argue the underlying merits at that time, instead of waiting over a year later to do it again. This case is now six years old, and the interesting thing is that uh, Abrahams would like to see this go back to trial again, where a lot of the players and a lot of the facts will really have been forgotten or lost. That's the law that supports Mr. Drock. And we also have the facts. And I think I, I'd like to take a moment just to provide some more backdrop on this transaction that Mr. Haynes described. Mr. Trogan is, as indicated in the record, is not the most stable human being. And he has an interesting past, but it was really created by a medical condition known as bipolar schizophrenia. He was found to be disabled. He received Social Security benefits for that. He had a lump sum of cash, and he and his mother went to Abraham, nonetheless, to buy this Jeep that's caught up in this tug of war. Um, he met Beltran. Beltran knew about Mr. Trogdon's disability and really took advantage of him. Uh, Beltran knew that Trogdon wanted to have friends, he was kind of the oddball out, and befriended him and used him, quite frankly, to drive him around and do some things that probably in hindsight they shouldn't have done. Eventually, uh, as Mr. Haynes points out, Mrs. Trogdon locked up the car. She got tired of seeing her son out in the battle with his marriage do well, so she had the car put in the garage. But at that time, they devised a plan, not because there was some pending criminal charge or some fear that the the car would be removed and impounded, but because he just wanted it out. So they decided that he would sign over the title to Beltran. Once the car came out of the garage, Beltran would give it back. But here's what really happened. Beltran drives poor little Matt Trogdon down to the Sheffield Giant Eagle, tells him to go inside, look for his grandmother, and then drives away, never to be seen or heard from again. He takes the car down to Montrose Kia, right off I-90 and Detroit Road, and tries to unload it there the first time. He shows up late in the day. He's got no driver's license. He has no insurance. He has a car that's been completely paid for, less than a year old, with mileage on a title that doesn't match mileage on the odometer. And he's trying to unload it for any car. He doesn't even care. The Montrose employee testified that something didn't seem right. He went inside. He plugged in Beltran's name on the docket sheet. He realized that this fellow had been charged and convicted of forgery and theft and all kinds of things that you just don't want to have on your record. At that point in time, he decided he didn't want to do business with Mr. Beltran, and so Beltran left. The next day, he goes right up the hill to Abraham, has the same problem, but this time he has two different license plates on the car, one of which is a dealer plate. The odometer still doesn't match. He has no driver's license. He has no insurance. He has some pals with him that look like people we don't want to associate with, and he's trying to do the same thing. And he trades an 09 Jeep with low mileage, fully paid for, for an old beat-up Nissan Sentra and some cash. 
something didn't sound right. Abraham should have known. Well, even if Abraham says they didn't know at that time, Attorney Wilson put him on notice and said this car was taken by fraud. So the idea that Mr. Trogdon is a stopped is contradicted by the facts. I want to turn to a minute to the attorney fee argument because, as Mr. Haynes pointed out, that's where we've spent a lot of our time in the last three years of this case. The trial court initially awarded attorney fees as a measure of compensatory damages, and this court, going back as far as 1937, has said that in a conversion case, attorney fees are part of or can be part of compensatory damages. That same principle was echoed more recently in 1999 down in Saudi County when the Court of Appeals said the exact same thing. So the idea that attorney fees have to be met with a punitive damages finding or a bad faith finding or a statute or a contract is not necessarily true in all instances. The trial court recognized that this was a case that had gone on for many years over the value of a car that, quite frankly, was far less than the amount of time that the attorneys had put into the case. The trial court awarded the attorney fees, but had lost jurisdiction to do so, which this court pointed out in appeal number two. We went back for a hearing on attorney fees. At that point in time, Judge McCorney was handling Judge Burge's docket. We had a hearing on those fees. Trogdon presented expert testimony from attorney Lee Colson. He's been practicing for 30 plus years. There was no objection to his qualifications from Abraham and no questions from Abraham, quite frankly, about the nature of the fee agreement, which is contested in their brief, or really any argument made about whether attorney fees were appropriate for the disqualification proceeding that had taken place. So the court, after hearing all of that, determines that $57,000 is appropriate for five years of litigation. Appeal number three is filed, and here we are again today. And we think that most importantly, the waiver argument should dispose of all of this, not just for assignments one, two, three, and four, but also assignment number five related to attorney fees, because the bulk of that argument, again, was never made in the trial court. We'd ask that this court affirm the trial court's decision and put an end to this litigation once and for all. Well, how, how would um, the waiver argument apply to the attorney fees? that once the Court of Appeals remanded, then how does waiver apply for the third uh, entry? Sure. The arguments that are made on appeal about the propriety of the attorney fees were not made at the trial court, and this I is see. not a forum to make okay. an argument for the first time. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Council, you have uh, five minutes. I have, I have nothing for okay. you. Okay, thank you. I thank rely you. on the brief. Yes, thank you both for your presentations. The court will take the matter under advisement. We'll issue an opinion which will be sent to both parties, and certainly you may check the Supreme Court website as we post our decisions. Have thank a good you very day. much. Thank you, Your Honor.